Hello and welcome to Spirit Pig. Inspired by the mission 7 Billion Fulfilled People, I track down the greatest thought leaders on the planet and interview them about happiness and fulfillment. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Ian McKilchrist. Ian is a world-renowned psychiatrist, neuroscientist and writer. He's the man behind the book The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World, which Rowan Williams, former Archbishop of Canterbury, said is one of the most important books I've read in the first decade of this century. Some prominent scientists and thinkers described it as a dazzling masterpiece and possibly the book of the century. He believes that one half of the brain, the left hemisphere, is slowly taking power, and we in the Western world are simultaneously feeding its ambitions. This half of the brain is very proficient at creating technologies, procedures, and systems, but it cannot understand the implications of these on the people and the world around it. McKilchrist knows that if he is right, we may be creating the technologies and the conditions that will spell our own downfall. It's it's a fascinating topic. I'm really excited just to jump in. Um, first of all, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Not at all. Despite popularity in the 60s and the 70s after the first split brain operations, talking about the brains in terms of left side and right side is now, I guess it's somewhat of a, an unpopular topic amongst neuroscientists. Why, why exactly is that? Well, as you say, uh, there was a sort of period in which people said, some rather rash things about it, and it became identified as pop science. And I was, ident I was uh, advised by m my colleagues not to touch the topic with a barge pole. <laughs> However, uh, there clearly are huge differences between the two hemispheres, whatever people say. Um, I think the, the safest thing to say to people is not to believe anything they've heard about the topic um, until they uh, take a look at my book, because uh, I spent 20 years uh, researching what we really do know about differences between the hemispheres, and they are very important and interesting, I think. So talking about some of those actual physical differences, over the course of human evolution, the two hemispheres of the brain have actually gotten more and more divided. So the actual physical structure, they're even more separated from one another than they ever were, aren't they? So for, for most of evolution, there have been just a few fibers connecting the left and right sides of the, of the what you might call the brain. Um, but in, in mammalian evolution, uh, the corpus callosum, this, this thicker band of fibers, did evolve. Interestingly, though, since the first mammals, it's got less and less in size compared with the size of the brain. And it's also become, to a large extent, inhibitory. So it seems to be more about separation than it is about union of these two distinct neuronal masses. And, and the way, I mean, you might correct me, I might get this completely wrong, but like the way evolution works, like if there was a reason or a purpose for it uh, to all come together under one structure, it would have. So like, for example, our skull used to be many different parts and then it did it not just, yes. it became then one thing. So if there was a reason for these two to to become one, then that would have happened. So the fact, the simple fact that they are so divided is almost, it, it, it says something in itself, correct? Absolutely. I mean, it's an extraordinary fact that uh, the brain's power exists simply in making connections, and yet it has a whopping divide down the middle. Why? If, if nature had, had, as it were, wanted or preferred a unified brain, we'd be having one now. Some of the stuff from the 1670s, like you said, was just that was, it was just plain wrong. But we can now start to realize that actually the purpose of the left hemisphere is to enable very detailed attention and focus so we can manipulate, control and influence the world around us. When the purpose of the right hemisphere is to enable us to relate to and understand the world, more like more big picture, would you say? And so... That's a fair summary, yes. Okay, and so what's happened now is that we've actually ended up where in a world where everything is kind of reduced to the agenda of the left hemisphere. So what was really fascinating is that you were, I think you were saying from like, was it the 4th or 5th BC, um, century BC in the Augustinian era, there was this wonderful balance and that almost, that balance between the left and the right hemispheres was kind of almost lasted up to the 15th or 16th century in Europe. You're talking about the second half of the book where I look at the, the way in which in different cultures we have prioritized the way of looking at the world of one hemisphere over the other. And what I've suggested is that in the um, 5th or 6th century BC in, in Athens, and then again in the Augustinian era in Rome, which is about 500 years later, 
and then again at the Renaissance in Europe in, say, the 15th century, there have been key moments at which the two have been working very well together. They coincide with a, gr a greatly productive era for each of those three civilizations. Um, and what I suggest is that since the 18th century in Europe, there has been a move more and more towards the dominance of the left hemisphere's view to the expense of that of the right hemisphere. They, they need to be balanced, but they don't show the same things. In a way, they're, 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 they're incompatible, but they have to be held together somehow. So, for example, in the left hemisphere's world, there are bits that have to be put together mechanically in order to create a reality. Whereas in the right hemisphere's world, there already is a reality which is connected and flowing and changing. And the detailed view simply localizes a little bit of that bigger picture. So things don't have to be put together because for that world picture, they already are. And equally for the, for the left hemisphere's world picture, it understands things in the way a computer would. It has to be explicit and it has to rationally follow a certain line of argument. Whereas the right hemisphere can understand things that are implicit and much of our communication is implicit. I can't help you understand Hamlet if you don't understand it. I can't explain Hamlet to a computer. There aren't a bunch of rules with whereby I can suddenly make a computer understand Hamlet. And unfortunately, our thinking is becoming more and more like a rather clever piece of technology. One central point that you kind of emphasize is that there's actually, there's not, there's absolutely nothing wrong with the left hemisphere. The left hemisphere isn't like the baddie. It's not about getting rid of the left hemisphere, but it's simply about it doesn't know its own limitations. So, I mean, it's a wonderful tool. It's a great servant. But the danger is that we're living in a society where we've elevated it to the master. That's the issue, where we've, we're putting it in a role that it, it shouldn't be. Exactly. And that's why the book bears the title, The Master and His Emissary, uh, subtitled The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World. But it, the, the image in the title is that it is the left hemisphere is a very good servant if it does what it's asked to do. But the trouble is that it only too quickly thinks it knows more than the right hemisphere, which in reality knows more. Uh, it literally does. That's not a figure of speech. It actually, uh, in the book that I'm writing now, which is entitled There Are No Things, uh, I'm, I'm explaining that uh, in literal, uh, in a literal sense that can be entirely substantiated, uh, neurologically, the right hemisphere knows, takes in, attends more, judges better, perceives better, um, and is more in touch with reality effectively than the left hemisphere. Interestingly, in the pop psychology, the version of things is that the left hemisphere is um, is this rather boring accountant-like figure that um, is at least reliable, uh, whereas the right hemisphere tends to be a bit... Uh, temperamental, a bit pink and fluffy, very creative, but needs anchoring by that good, solid left hemisphere. Well, it turns out that's not the case at all. It turns out that in every respect, the right hemisphere is more reliable, more down to earth, more, well, it might be like this, but it might be like that. Ramachandran calls it the devil's advocate. In other words, it's the one that is able to see there might be another way of seeing this, where the left hemisphere, once it's stuck on an idea, is absolutely stuck with that idea. Okay. So we get people who, who, who are, you know, very much um, fixed in a worldview in which they think they know everything because they don't know very much, and they can't be dislodged from it. That's a worry. If I was listening to this podcast and I've just switched on why, why, why does this matter? Why should I care? Well, you come across it every day in the way in which things are more and more bureaucratized. Essentially, the left hemisphere way of thinking is bureaucratic mentality. And so just trying to do something that has a human element to it is increasingly difficult because it has to follow a flow diagram and it has to fit in the boxes. Sometimes having conversations with people over the telephone when something goes wrong, most people will have this experience. So you need to talk to your bank or to the telephone company or somebody else. They've got a script they're working from in which 
the actual individual circumstances you're in don't actually fit this and they're not answering your point because there's no enmeshing of these two. That's very simple. But on a much bigger level, what it means is that we think we know how to do things, but in fact, in doing what we think is the logical thing, we make things worse. So it looks logical to go into the Gulf and stabilize uh, a situation that appears incendiary. In fact, what we do is massively destabilize. We think we could control the stock markets. Many Nobel Prize winning economists thought this, so that there will never be another crash. As soon as they'd made these um, somewhat hubristic pronouncements, there was an almighty crash. We protect children from danger and we make them vulnerable. We, uh, we think that the only way to educate a child is to put lots of information into them and by doing that, we actually drive out the independence of thinking, which is the point of education in itself. We protect ourselves from germs because it looks logical and make ourselves so vulnerable that we're, const we're constantly falling ill. So, I mean, these are just simple examples in daily life of how a kind of apparently rational way of thinking that just sees one little thing and goes for it leaves out all the complexity of the big picture, which you really ought to take into account if you're going to understand how to behave as a rational person. And moreover, the left hemisphere can't understand those things that we would learn from what is now becoming increasingly rare, an acquaintance with literature, philosophy and history, the, the humanities. Instead, what is prioritized is sequential thinking, using facts. Now, interestingly, you might think, well, that's good for science. But actually, interestingly, it's not. All the great mathematicians and scientists will, in the, their accounts, and there are hundreds of these, some of them I detail in the book I'm writing, show that the way they arrived at their conclusions was not by following a procedure. They had an insight. They, they saw an analogy. And that analogy illuminated something. And it was only months later that they did the boring paperwork of showing how you might get there by a sequence of steps. So in fact, for science to progress, as much as for the humanities and the arts to progress, we need to abandon the view of the world as a mechanism that's built up from bits that we know and we put together. Instead, we need to be aware of resonances in things that speak to us and listen to those. You, you see... I guess three reasons for this shift, this shift that we see towards left hemisphere. Could you maybe just explain briefly what those three reasons are? I don't know the three you're thinking of, but one, uh, one is that it's much simpler um, to see things in the left hemisphere way. Um, it, it, any, any child that has used Lego um, is able to understand the way the left hemisphere thinks, whereas it actually takes living, thinking, feeling, pondering, to understand, uh, I mean, we have an intuitive understanding of the right hemisphere, but actually to explain uh, why the right hemisphere is important. That's one. Um, the left hemisphere also is the hemisphere of grabbing things. It is the one which controls the right hand with which we grasp things. And it's good at helping us manipulate the world. It's not very good at helping us understand the world because it doesn't really know very much. But it is terribly useful for um, getting hold of stuff. So that way of thinking makes you stupid but rich. Um, and I suppose <laughs> another reason is that we have externalized in the environment around us a version of the way the left hemisphere sees the world. Uh, concrete, rectilinear, mechanical. Uh, whereas we used to live surrounded by the natural world, which makes you think a bit about, you know, what is what is the world really like um, and what is the truth about living things and the mystery of being on this planet at all and being with this whole thing of what's around me. Uh, that used to be present until a couple of hundred years ago to 99 percent of people on the planet. Now it isn't. So I think those would be three reasons I'd, I'd, uh, I'd look at. Um, and people might say, well, it's rather good if it makes us rich. But, you know, it's led to very many problems. In a couple of hundred years, we've reached the point of exterminating 
many species and we're looking set to exterminate a lot more. We've ravaged nature in a way that it never has been before. We've, you know, had some pretty catastrophic wars. And I know that it's fashionable for people to say, oh, well, you know, it, things are getting better all the time. I think there are things we can be grateful for, like less death in childbirth, but there won't be a planet uh, or at least humans on it um, uh, to enjoy things like better health if we carry on destroying things the way we are. So it's made us rich but stupid, in my view. Yeah. It was interesting hearing you saying how like you, you have, um, even behind your house, you have like a mountain which is billions of years old. And, and this ties into your book about how everything is a process. Like if you, everything is just about, if you had a time-lapse camera and it was just facing the mountain for a long enough period, even the, this mountain, which has been there for billions of years, you would see that moving. And so it was, it was an interesting like, metaphor about how everything is... Just you just, just got to change the time frame from a few minutes to billions of years, but everything is in this becoming, this flow, um, and that was just a, it was a wonderful way to describe it. This huge billion year old mountain, actually, even that is an organic thing. It's moving, and um, yeah, it was, it was it was really interesting. Well, yeah. well, yes, thank you. I mean, the, the the idea that everything flows is familiar from an early Greek philosopher, Heraclitus, and and has been important in some philosophers in the last hundred years, such as. Uh, Alfred North Whitehead. But it, for me, it is a very, very deep truth that everything does flow. It just depends on which time scale you look at it. Uh, if you look at things in a long enough time scale, the solidest things that you know um, are really just frozen moments of flow. And that that's just a small observation. But actually, believe me, from that observation, so much follows about the nature of things. And that's what I'm writing about now. You said, with all due respect to the American Constitution, you can't pursue happiness. The more you pursue it, the more it runs from you. Happiness is a byproduct of forgetting yourself. There's such a thing as happiness, of course, and there's such a thing as fulfillment, but they don't come from being themselves pursued, much as um, the best way to enjoy sleep uh, is not to uh, have a plan to go to sleep now. You will go to sleep when you're ready to go to sleep. And the more you force yourself to go to sleep, the less you'll do. Mm. So it's a little like that. Um, it comes, I think that's right, as a byproduct of forgetting about yourself or about pursuing happiness. It comes from the most surprising places. Often it comes from things that could be quite frustrating. For example, it comes from overcoming obstacles. Uh, one might think that fulfillment and happiness came from there being no obstacles, a life that didn't have, uh, uh, as it were, its downside. But actually that would be impossible. Well, it, it can never happen anyway, but it, 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 in that world it would be impossible to, to have fulfillment or happiness. Nothing can be detached from its, what we think of as its opposite, but it's not actually its opposite, it's part of it. It's a bit like you think of a, an iron bar that is a magnet and you say, I don't really like the South Pole. I only like the North Pole. I'm going to cut the South Pole off. You don't get rid of the South Pole. You just shorten the magnet. <laughs> now, life is like this, or, or like a circle. If you go far enough around it to get away from where you are, you end up coming back to the same thing. So a thing and its opposite are bound up with one another. So fulfillment is often paradoxical in that way. Uh, so pursuing it is not a sensible plan. But there are things you can do to stop yourself from being fulfilled. You can uh, constantly compare yourself with other people. You can constantly pursue what other people tell you are the important goals rather than consult and listen inside. <laughs> um, and things that actually take away much of your um, obvious utility, like becoming a parent, um, which gives you less time to do things, many more things to deal with, many moments of crisis, can give you enormous fulfillment. So in my life, having friends, being a father, and pursuing things that I don't understand and don't really know the answer to have been the fulfilling 
things, as well as some rather straightforward things like um, listening to music and being close to nature. Those those are very important for me, very important. Mm-hmm. But that's a personal. It they reminded, might not be for others. I won't. I can't remember the exact details, but it reminded me of a study um, about because talking about that paradoxical relationship and like relation um, adversity and fulfillment and not going straight for it. They did a study with I think it was with UK, America, Taiwan, Japan, and it was one other country. And they said for the next month you've got to actively pursue happiness. And that when the results came in. They realised that the UK country, UK and America, actually after a month were less happy, and then Taiwan, Japan, and the third country were more happy. And they're like, "This is really strange." They had the exact same task. What's the difference? And they came to the conclusion: when the American and UK people, it'd be much more of an individual thing. Like, I want to make me happy, so I've got to buy something for me. I've got to, um, you know, buy do some shopping. I've got to work on me, 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 me. But with the Eastern countries, there's much more of a collective idea. So if I had to try and become happier, I'm thinking, how can I help my community? How can I help my family? How can I help others? And so the byproduct was, oh, actually, I feel better as a result. And those different shifts on our idea of how to pursue, how to achieve happiness was, was the difference, which is, I found that so interesting. I love, I, I, I love that. I didn't know that, but it, it absolutely rings true with everything else I know about uh, the differences between those two cultures or societies. But uh, you're absolutely right that uh, we probably all know, actually, that despite ourselves, some of the most enjoyable and fulfilling times have, have been when we've been involved with other people in a common project. Mm-hmm. And one very simple little practical thing that you can do uh, to make yourself happy is to do um, an entirely unnecessary act of kindness to somebody. <laughs> um, it, it's uh, much more rewarding than doing something for yourself, paradoxically. Um, if, if, if we kind of took heed and we had a better integration of both hemispheres of our brain, what, I mean, do you have like a picture of like, what, what could society look like? How, how would a fully balanced society, what would that look like? I think it would be more fully human. I mean, one of, <laughs> that rather begs a few questions. But one of the things that I feel rather strongly is that somehow our society is becoming less human. It's becoming more abstract and technical and cerebrally kind of oriented, but an awful lot of what it means to be a human being, that sort of embodied togetherness um, in which, you know, we live closer to one another and to the natural world, that seems to be missing. I think people's education would be rounder. um, They'd be less likely to to see things in simple black and white terms. Um, I think there'd be more gentleness and humor involved. There'd be a lot more respect for, for nature, for the extraordinary creativity of the natural world. I mean, when you, when you conceive what it was like before we started decimating it, um, you know, just the wealth of species, the richness of, of life. It's like being invited to the most unbelievable party that ever existed. And then we've gone around with a chainsaw and massacred, you know, most of the guests. <laughs> uh, that's good. And meanwhile, said, but it's a great party because now I've got all the food and I'm getting drunk fast on my hubris, my knowledge that I know everything. I can sort everything out. Uh, Don't you worry, I can put people back together again. Just you wait. Um, I I think, you know, it it would be a different world. It would be a much saner world. Um, A much less grabbing, grasping, me-orientated world. Uh, And to say it's a fantasy is, is wrong because... At periods in history, we have had societies that were relatively stable and made huge advances in both science and the arts, in um, creating juster and fairer societies and so forth. So it can be done. So what can can we do? What's what's, what's the almost like a a call to action? How can we, even if it just moves the needle forward, just that extra couple of percent just in the right direction, what can we, people listening, what can we go away and do? Well, I suppose you're asking for something practical to do um, that each individual person can do. 
Um, and that's easy enough to answer. Stop doing quite a lot of the things that you think are terribly important. Then you'll discover what really is important. So the first thing to do is to create an area of space or an area of time in the day when you absolutely don't do any of the things you think are so vital to existence. To stop constantly talking, listening, communicating, create a space for peace and listen and don't expect to hear anything to begin with. Carry on until you do. When you do, it'll be very worthwhile hearing it. So that's a very practical, simple thing that you can incorporate into your life. Um, but also on a bigger scale, what we need to do is urgently to stop doing, once again, some of the things that we think are so important. Stop thinking that increasing material well-being in small ways by extravagant exploitation of the world and exploitation of poorer people um, who can do slave labor for us. Stop thinking that that is a, a worthwhile goal for a developed society. Start thinking in terms that are different about how we can enhance the things that we're so busy eroding all the time so that there's a world in which there is more room in time and space for what I call betweenness, the appreciation of connection with things, uh, less atomistic uh, attempt to satisfy um, that little particle that is you. Because in the end, none of us is a little particle at all. Connection. They often, different people, different walks of lives, different countries, completely different expertise. Connection, connection, connection. It is a theme, it's a word, it's come up so many so much time there's so much yeah it's I'm, it's wonderful that you ended on that because i mean i i almost i've i've almost had to stop saying it just because i feel like a broken record but i'm glad that you it came out of your mouth one of your pieces of advice that you just said um towards the end when you said you know just create the, that space those space of time i would say about two years ago um i um realized that i was always in like doing mode so you know i'd wake up you know you check your phone reply to emails, meeting, meeting, yeah. doing, 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 doing. And so I started this thing called No Input Tuesdays. So every single Tuesday, I have, from when I wake up until maybe two or three in the afternoon, I have about a five-hour window, and I'll just go and sit somewhere. And I can have no input, so no computer, no phone, no even music. And all I can have is a pen and paper. And, you know, you start twiddling your thumbs, and you're a bit like, you know, you're a bit, uh, you know, you get bored, but no, I'd stick with it. And so on the surface, it seems, what are you doing? That's so unpractical. You know, it's such a waste of time. But hands down, my biggest aha moments, breakthroughs, do this with the business, speak with that person, drop that, ignore that altogether, have always come in that block where you'd have this huge vacuum of empty space because we never can just have that, that, that just that empty space. And it's been the biggest game changer in my life. Absolutely love it. And I often recommend it to other people, especially when people are just constantly overwhelmed and anxious. And especially um, I do some coaching with entrepreneurs and they're very, um, you know, just, just go, 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 go. And when you get busy and when the calendar gets blocked out, you're looking at it and the no input Tuesday will be the first thing which you want to like, just ignore and chuck some meetings in there. You've got to protect it. Like it's like just Holy grail because that is where the magic happens. And I'm now got better and better. And now I kind of, I go on walks every afternoon. So I'm, I often stop computer work at about two every afternoon and use the afternoons just to think and to be creative. But it's been the biggest, it's been the biggest gift as well. I love it. Fantastic. And, and it, I so believe that. Um, it, it, and people won't get it until they start doing it. But that focus, constantly being focused and do, 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 that is just a summary of the left hemisphere is now in control and nothing creative will happen, nothing. Mm. I mean, you're just absolutely ensuring that nothing good is now going to come with this. So if you really want to fail badly, then just go for it, man, and be focused. What you need is to have controlled times of unfocus. And for most people, the only moment in the day is when they're in the shower because you have to close your eyes and you can't actually do anything. So why is it that so many people's aha moments happen in the shower? You know, if you, if you want a left hemisphere um, bullet point, it's have more showers. 
<laughs> but in what, to, to be very serious, in what I'm uh, writing, you know, I've spent a lot of time reviewing how people, and I mentioned it a bit, how people make their breakthroughs, how people make their discoveries, um, and how good people's judgments are. And it's astonishing how much better it is when they're not fussing over it and trying to make it happen. It's usually when they're looking somewhere else, completely else, and then it happens. And then, as I say, the drudgery of, well, I know that's right, but how am I going to justify it? And then they eventually find a way of doing so. But the insight is it doesn't come by trying. And life, what makes life fulfilling is the constant ahas, the, the, the moments of insight. <laughs> anyway, Amen. We must, I, I've really enjoyed one of these as much. So thank you very much. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. How can people find out more? How can people read your books? Okay, well, um, I don't do social media, but I do have a website. Uh, just Google my name. And uh, you can also go to Amazon or your local bookshop and uh, buy The Master and His Emissary. Um, there's a little ebook um, called The Divided Brain, I think, or Divided Brain and something or other. Uh, I can't even remember, but you can download it to a phone and it costs you nothing or next to nothing. Um, and look out for There Are No Things, which is the thing that really excites me now. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, the fact that you are in hibernation writing mode and you still um, had gave time just to speak for me, I really appreciate it. Um, thank you so much for sharing all those ideas and uh, good luck with the writing of the new book. I look forward to checking it out. Well, thank you very much. And it's been a great pleasure and good luck with your various uh, podcasts and ventures.